it's just a very rewarding thing to see people. Oftentimes, a Meals on Wheels volunteer may be the only person that that person sees during the day, and it, it just feels good. That was Ed Batzel. Ed is a volunteer with the AmeriCorps Seniors Program. He was recently presented with a Lifetime Achievement Award from the President for his volunteer service with 50 Ford Fresh Meals on Wheels. Ed has logged more than 4,000 hours and 25 years as a meal deliverer. In November, Ed will be 90. In this podcast, we learn about his life, his hobbies, his family, including the recent loss of his wife and how he is coping. One of my co-workers said, for me, meeting Ed has changed the picture of what it looks like to be 90. We're glad you joined us to hear these inspiring stories from older adults, people who have so much experience and words of wisdom to share, but are sometimes overlooked in society today. I'm Sally Hussey, the CEO of 50 Forward, a Nashville-based nonprofit. Our mission is to support, champion, and enhance the lives of those 50 and older. And I'm Susan Sizemore, your guide through these beautiful conversations with those who are living life to the fullest and who know how to squeeze the day in their second chapter of life. Now in my second chapter and Encore career, I'm following my passion for sharing the stories of older adults with you and with the world. Because of that, we're now doubling up on our episodes each month. If you like what you hear, please rate and follow Squeeze the Day on your favorite podcast platform. Today's Squeeze the Day is brought to you by the All of Us Research Program from the National Institutes of Health. Learn how you can help change the future of health by participating in the program. Visit www.joinallofus.org to learn more. Let's meet the man and the volunteer who's inspiring us to live our best life. Welcome, Ed. Thank you. Glad you have me. It's so nice to see you, and I'm really excited to talk to you a little bit about your history and about what you're doing these days. So you were just presented with the President's Volunteer Service Lifetime Achievement Award. Will you tell us about that experience? Well, first, it was a total surprise. Uh, I had only very limited uh, knowledge of that organization, and uh, I had never heard of the award, and I was surprised. So that organization is the AmeriCorps Seniors Program, and Michael Smith, who is the CEO, came to Nashville and presented it to you. So the AmeriCorps Senior Program, under that umbrella falls a lot of services that the older adults do across the United States. And one of those is the Meals on Wheels program. So over the last 25 years, you've delivered more than 4,000 meals and were one of our first regular delivery um, volunteers to return after COVID. Why was that so important to you, especially at that time? Well, I discovered very quickly that I just have gotten a lot out of it. Uh, In fact, I've told numerous people that... uh, I have gotten more out of it than uh, I've ever put into it. It's uh, quite a little drive from here into Nashville, into Davidson County, but it has been worth it. I have met some unforgettable characters, Mm. spent time with a lot of uh, wonderful people. I still remember Robert Huff, who has been dead now for eight or nine years. I used to visit with him regularly. In fact, I went back on days that I was not volunteering and sat with him for a while. So he just was a fascinating guy. It's just a very rewarding thing to see people. Oftentimes, a Meals on Wheels volunteer may be the only person that that person sees during the day, and it, it just feels good. You know, it's interesting as you're talking about Mr. Huff, it's not just really dropping off a meal. Friendships are formed. Yes, several friendships. So let's talk a little bit about just some hard knocks in life. I know recently you lost your wife after 65 years of marriage, and you've had to make some really interesting adjustments, not only as an individual, but also as the head of your household now. Will you share a bit about that? Well... A lot of our listeners, I suspect, know what it means to lose a spouse. I think probably the biggest adjustment I've had is simply being alone. 
sleeping alone and normally not having anybody come into the house. And I discovered very, very quickly that the answer to that is to get out of the house, which is what I have done. I, in fact, I was out of the house doing normal things uh, very soon after June died. And that's one of the things that a volunteer situation does for you. It gets you out of the house and with, with other people. I didn't have to make any adjustments as far as taking care of the house because June taught me about the bathroom bowl uh, <laughs> a, Good a, for her. a long time ago. And I was raised with a uh, household of girls so that uh, I know what to do with the toilet seat. Another big adjustment for me has been healthy food preparation mm. because uh, even though I I didn't know about the laundry, but laundry is simple. The cooking, my wife did all of the cooking, excellent healthy cook, which is one of the reasons why I'm as healthy as I am. And I've had to learn how to uh, shop. In fact, I ran out a little while ago to get one item from Kroger's because I'm having a frittata tonight. Wow. And I didn't have any egg beaters. So I had high cholesterol. I had. I had a heart attack and Uh am on medication. Uh I had a heart attack last May. Oh, my gosh. And my, well, my heart has completely recovered. Mm -hmm. So my cholesterol is, is ridiculously low. When we married, I was... 55 pounds heavier than I am now. Mm. And June had, in her family background, every imaginable gene for bad stuff. So she took care of herself through cooking, and it just so happened that the kinds of things that would help her, she could very easily slip into my diet. So I had healthy food, low-salt food. And I'm having my weights up a little bit now, and uh, I'm trying to get it back down again. So, yes, she was not only healthy, but she was an excellent cook. She won in high school the Miss Betty Crocker Award, So, <laughs> and she majored in high school in home economics, So, and she loved to cook. Well, good for her. And a couple things that you mentioned. First of all, the high cholesterol and getting it back at bay and having it be very, very low is hard. And so kudos to you for doing that. B, for our listeners, I think it's interesting that you mentioned June had a home economics degree because that was very common back in probably the 50s and 60s. And she graduated from high school in in the 50s. Mm Mm-hmm. I want to ask you one thing about laundry, too. You don't mix reds and whites together, do you? Well, if I had any reds, I probably would. (laughs) Yes, I do. The trick is when you have a new item, there is a product that you put in with the first time you wash something, and you can mix. It protects the color of a new item. And I can't think of the name of it. I'm... In my second chapter of life, I'm, I'm past the 60-year mark. You're almost at the 90-year mark, and I'm learning about a new domestic product from you. Thank you. I do have some colored, some uh, knit shirts, and I put them in with black pants with no problem. Uh-huh. Be sure you're using a cold water. No, I use warm water. Oh. <laughs> There's a button that says <laughs> quick wash, and I don't fool with the warm water, the cool water. <laughs> Anything else. My daughter taught me this. Well, I'm sure she's right, and I'm learning from you. So this is great. So I want to go back a bit to losing your wife. What advice do you have for others to prepare for life's unpredictable situations? For a man, you better learn to cook. Learn Mm. something about food preparation. I'm surprised at how many men whose wives do all of the finances— My wife did ours, but that's only because if it were left up to me, we would not have any money because I'm a spender. She was a a very careful, organized budgeter. Mm -hmm. But she left me with Excel spreadsheets that were totally organized and all the formulas were all worked out and all I know enough about computers. 
all I have to do is enter the monthly totals. Since she died, I've told other men this. You better learn how to cook, and you better learn about finances. I've been surprised at how many have said they didn't know that their wife took care of all the bills. Hmm. And uh, that's a bad sign. Frequently, I've had conversations with family members and friends about, we all know that day is coming, but what do we do to really establish documents that you need to as well, you know, like living wills. I I can't tell you how many people I know with children who don't have living wills or don't have any sort of, you know, estate plans or anything in place. Yeah, yeah. Is there anything else that you can think about maybe that you might want to share with somebody who's left without a spouse? Uh, Yes. Uh, The the things that you just mentioned about living wills, uh, uh, wills and living wills, and uh, powers of attorney, which I thought we had, and we did not have the one that allows my daughter, who is the executor, to, if something happens to me and I cannot write a check, my daughter can now write a check. And that's something that I had to do, and it's simple to do through an attorney, and it's inexpensive. Simple things like whether or not you want to be cremated or have a traditional funeral. Mm. Both June and I, uh, she wrote her own celebration of life service, selected scriptures, selected uh, persons that were going to participate in it, and uh, I've done the same thing. And uh, we have in my house now a very famous blue book, which my children both know about, and it's in a cabinet behind me. And it's in a fireproof case, and it is. it has keys to the house. It has a keys to, to our lockbox. There is a lot of details that are better done while you're still living so that when you die, things will be done the way you want them to be done. Mm-hmm. Thank you for sharing that. I feel like... I hear more and more today about people who are looking at putting some of those processes in place, but I think it makes perfect sense, and it's something we probably should be talking about more. Let's talk a little bit about your roots. Well, I have done a lot of research on my mother's people and my father's people who came, like a lot of others, uh, most Recently from Delaware and Maryland, I suspect Scotch-Irish as our high percentage of people around Tennessee and Kentucky. I'm originally from Kentucky. I have visited all of the counties where my people lived in Kentucky and have been in a number of uh, courthouses to check deeds, and I've visited every place that they lived, my grandparents, my great-grandparents, my great-great-grandparents, and have taken photographs of all of these places, and actually have done a little book that I did for my children and my grandchildren. It's a book of uh, photographs and text with uh, just a little bit, well, it's a lot of pictures because kids will not read text as quickly as they'll look at pictures. And uh, I did it for my children and my grandchildren, gave them a copy of the book. And uh, personally, I was born and raised in Kentucky, Uh, grew up in uh, Owensboro, Kentucky. Mm -hmm. And as I mentioned earlier, in a house full of girls, I am the only boy, and all of my sisters were older. They're all deceased now. I'm I'm very proud of the values that I got from my family. I'm a depression baby. My people were all farm people, Mm. grew up on a farm. And incidentally, my wife grew up on a farm. And I think one of the secrets of our marriage was that we came from almost identical backgrounds, so had the same values. Well, that, that farm life will teach you probably discipline, but a lot of hard work, I bet, as well. What about career? Tell us a little bit about some of your career work. Well, I was educated to be a Methodist preacher. Mm. And after a few years of that, decided that uh, it wasn't for me. 
but I did not want to leave the church, so I went to work for the Methodist Publishing House in Nashville. And when I was 54 years old, uh, as a part of the reorganization process of the publishing house, my, my job was discontinued. So I found myself having to do something different at an age when it's hard to get a job. Mm. So I took what had been a hobby, which was uh, building furniture, and tried to establish a custom-made furniture business, which lasted about a year, because I could not get people to pay me what it was worth. Uh, so when that didn't work out, I took a job with a group of uh, sales representatives of medical textbook publishers, which I did for about 10 years, and was a clinical sales representative for a group of medical textbook publishers. And then I quit work, and I haven't worked since. I'm a serious photographer. I don't sell my photographs. I don't sell furniture. I don't sell anything. I'm retired. Tell me what advice you have for people who are going to retire. Have something to do. Have a hobby. Volunteer at Meals on Wheels. Get active in something. Mm -hmm. I want to share a quote from one of my coworkers about you. Ed is a comforting and constant present in the lives of everyone he serves. And meeting Ed has changed the picture of aging and what it looks like to be 90. Tell us a bit about the importance of intergenerational sharing in your life. I wish I had time to tell you more about Robert Huff, who was nearing 100 oh. when he stopped getting Meals on Wheels. And up until two or three years before he died, when I delivered meals to him or went to visit with him, he was always on his computer doing a uh, Bible course. He was a member of a Baptist church and was still very active for as long as he could go. And then he, his religious life was uh, in that Bible study. He was retired from the post office, and he and I talked often about the main post office downtown Nashville on uh, Broadway, which I was in, that had the funny-looking floors. And uh, he worked as a custodian and actually was a volunteer of Meals on Wheels for about 10 years. He, he delivered Meals on Wheels. So anywhere there was 100 years old. And then my grandson, who works for Twitch, it's just fascinating for me to visit him and to see what he's into. He also collects and resells shoes. I never realized that there are collectors of athletic shoes. He has a friend that he played football with who decorates shoes with a sports star, a football player's name, for example. And Seth will get an autograph on the shoe and sell it for four hundred. He'll pay two hundred dollars and sell it for four hundred, five hundred, seven hundred. It's amazing what that guy is into. Somebody told me he's an entrepreneur, and he's not yet thirty years old. Wow! And uh, I have one granddaughter who's an artist. I have one granddaughter working on a PhD. I have a, a grandson who is in the nursery business, and June and I always made it a point to spend one-on-one -on -one time with these guys, and it has paid off. They still come to see me. And then my parents, my, my mother died at 101. My dad was 97. Dad had two sisters. One of them was 104. One of them was 106. Wow. Two, two women that lived together and never spoke. <laughs> Nobody in the family could figure out what the problem was. My family was strange, but, but I have thoroughly enjoyed wide ranges of people. So let's talk a little bit about family in general and what role family plays in your day-to-day -day life. I don't think I could exist now without my daughter. She and I text back and forth, not every day, but uh, virtually every day. My son 
owns a nursery and has a, a produce business. And I don't have any immediate family anymore. My sisters are all gone. My I have some nieces and nephews. And a couple of my nieces keep up with my photographs on uh, Facebook. Oh, I know that you're a bit of a photographer, but it's nice to know that you've got them on Facebook so people can see them. That's the only place that I put them, other than my computer. And I've got about 40,000 of those little suckers. Wow. What would you tell your younger self? Get started sooner on the non-material things of life, the spiritual side, particularly people relationships. Okay, we have a couple questions we ask all of our guests, and one of them is, what is one piece of advice your parents or maybe an older adult shared with you that at the time you thought, this is really silly, but now that phrase rings true to you in your everyday life? You can do anything that you set your mind to do that you really want to do. Very powerful. And what is it that you do to squeeze the day? I think it's the, the uh, I'm an early riser, and it's the first about hour, although it's getting longer, hour and a half that I spend in prayer and reading the Bible and journaling. Recently, I've become a journaler where I just sort of react to what's happening, good, bad, indifferent. That's good. That is not only therapeutic, but I think it also gives you a way to look back and gives an, others a chance to look back as well. Do you oh, journal? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to burn those suckers, <laughs> baby, <laughs> because I discuss my children in some of them. So. <laughs> it, that's a real journal, yes. <laughs> well, I want to thank you, Ed, today for joining us. Your story is inspiring and reinforces that challenges can become opportunities. We learn so much from one another and certainly from the experiences of those in their second chapter of life. Now we challenge everyone listening to go squeeze the day. Squeeze the Day is made possible through listeners like you. If you enjoy this podcast, please help us continue to share inspiring stories of older adults and visit 54.org. That's F-I-F-T-Y-F-O-R. W-A-R-D dot O-R-G to make a contribution. Now, as I leave you today, I'm sending you all a big squeeze. Until next time, 